You know what? When I was a kid, before I really got into film, if you were to ask me what my favorite movies were, there's a good chance the Ice Age series would have been my answer. They were way up there with Homeward Bound, Pokemon Heroes, Rugrats Go Wild, and the 2007 remake of Hairspray. The series was created by the Connecticut-based animation studio Blue Sky. The first one was released in 2002, and while I stopped updating myself on the series after the release of the fourth feature film in 2012, apparently they kept coming out all the way until 2022. And I love them. There was a point in time when I was a kid where I watched one of them nearly every night for like three months. And it's clear I wasn't alone in loving them, because they were really successful in their time. It seems like virtually everyone within a certain age demographic has seen at least one of them. However, the years generally have not been kind to the public perception of this franchise. Opinions range from people who believe the series has merely overstayed its welcome, to people who believe it was bad from the very start. However, nearly everyone tends to be in agreement on the later movies being absolutely terrible. What exactly counts as the later movies is a bit less well-defined. Pretty much everyone agrees that it's bad by the time you get to Collision Course, but there's a couple before that that are a little more... divisive. Now that the series has finally hit what could be considered a stopping point, it seems like a great time to do a retrospective, and see how the series holds up for me. Was it always overrated, or did it start out with some merit, and if it did, when and how did it go so wrong? The more familiar you are with the franchise as a whole, the weirder it is to come back to this original movie. You kind of forget things, like that humans used to have a presence in these movies, that Scrat used to borderline be a fourth member of the main group. He probably directly interacts with them more times in this first movie than he does in the rest of the series put together. That Diego used to be an outright villain, that Manny lost a family prior to the events of the series. All of these pretty major elements are scarcely even mentioned in any of the sequels, if they are at all. But more than anything else, it's weird how small-scale and simple the original movie is. By its end, Ice Age is a borderline sci-fi fantasy franchise, with each new entry being about the impending apocalypse in some new form. This first one is, essentially, a road trip movie. Three prehistoric animals find a human baby, and reluctantly team up to return the kid to his parents. The simplicity definitely works better for this series than whatever the hell it's doing by the fifth movie does, but I can't pretend I love everything about the first movie conceptually. The series is easily at its least enjoyable when it's doing this thing that I'll call checklist scenes. Sometimes a movie has certain beats that it feels like it has to hit, or jokes that it has to include, just because it's something usually done in other movies of the same genre, and it's usually pretty obvious when scenes that are included for that reason show up and the concept of a road trip movie definitely opens itself up to a lot of those. Don't make me reach back there. Well, he started it. I don't care who started it. I'll finish it. I'd say the main thing that helps this first movie stand out is the three main characters and the dynamic they have with each other. I don't want to oversell this, but these characters are really kind of assholes to each other, to a level I don't often see in family movies. Hey, why am I the poop checker? Because returning the runt was your idea. Because you're small and insignificant, and because I'll pummel you if you don't. Uh, why else? Now, Sid! At the start, Manny and Diego are not friendly with one another. Manny does not trust Diego, and for good reason, because we the audience know that Diego is planning on luring Manny and the baby into an ambush. He never mentions Sid to the other tigers. The what? I'm not good enough to kidnap! The thing that Manny and Diego eventually find common ground on is that they both hate Sid even more, and really enjoy tormenting him. Sid, meanwhile, has just been abandoned by his family, something that apparently happens on a regular basis. They left without me. They do this every year! Why? Doesn't anyone love me? So he is so desperate for companionship that he just puts up with this treatment. This dynamic is one of the few things that I would say actually remains pretty consistent throughout this series. While any outright hatred and intentional torment does mostly die down as the series goes on, generally, Manny and Diego are the two that actually become close friends, while Sid is this third wheel that they're frequently annoyed and embarrassed by, but ultimately they keep around, mostly because they feel sorry for him. This isn't to say that their entire found family dynamic I mean, sorry, found herd dynamic. That is actually one thing that consistently bothers me in this franchise, is how stupidly obvious the whole herd family metaphor is. 
We both might have wanted out of pack life, but at least I didn't trade one pack for another. I got something more. Oh, yeah? What's that? A herd. But anyway, that's not to say it's built entirely on sadism, pity, and desperation. They just happen to be some of the earlier things that push them closer together. Later in the movie, they do start to find more common ground with each other, largely in that they all start to genuinely care for the child they've been looking after, and in spite of how logistically ridiculous some of the events are, they result in the characters having some fairly well-done heart-to-hearts. Awkward PG-rated violence aside, like, seriously, what even was his injury here? The scene where Diego fully changes allegiance and has his fake-out sacrificial death? It's a pretty good scene. Yeah, I think I'm good to conclude that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with this original movie. It's not a masterpiece or anything, there's some pretty cliché elements, a lot of the jokes don't really land, and the animation can often look a bit dated, but it's perfectly decent as far as family-oriented animated movies go, with the positives generally outweighing the negatives. Whatever the issue with this franchise is, it started somewhere in the sequels. At first, I didn't even know this was actually its own thing. When I saw it on Letterboxd, I thought it was just the opening scene from the original movie released as its own short. But nope, it's separate. I realized as I was watching it that I actually had seen it somewhere before, but I can't even begin to imagine when or where. It's no wonder that I forgot it existed, because there really isn't a whole lot of note about it. If you've ever seen the opening scene of the fourth movie, this short is essentially a really toned-down version of that. Scrat accidentally cracks the earth with his acorn again, and this time it causes the continental drift. I guess there is that one bit where they play that song from Sleeping Beauty, which is a little ironic given the eventual Disney acquisition. Overall, though, not particularly exciting. <laughs> While we're getting into the sequels, here's a fun little factoid. With four of them, Ice Age has more theatrically released direct sequels than any other animated franchise ever, at least in the West. The only others that even rival it are Toy Story, which apparently has a fifth one announced, and Shrek, which would beat it if you counted spin-offs. It's weird that it happened from something that conceptually started out so simple, but Ice Age immediately became Blue Sky's flagship franchise. This obviously isn't to say that all of their other stuff was bad, but nothing else Blue Sky made ever came close to Ice Age's level of success. Even without adjusting for inflation, only two of their non-Ice Age movies have made more money than the first Ice Age from 2002, and compared to the second through fourth Ice Age movies, it's not even a competition. Of course, this is speculation on my part, but when the other movies they made just haven't been nearly as successful, I have to imagine that this unprecedented amount of sequels was done, at least somewhat, out of... obligation. With that in mind, I was kind of expecting a drop in quality from the first movie. What I was not expecting was for the sequelitis to start setting in this much, this fast. The Meltdown was probably the movie in this series that I rewatched the most as a kid, because for a while it was the only one we had on DVD, so I have some nostalgic connection to it, but when I actually think about it critically, what really even happens in this one? Well, obviously the titular Meltdown, but that isn't really relevant until the climax. Surely the plot isn't just going to be the same three characters walking from point A to point B again, right? This time, they don't even have a baby to bond over, and even if they did, they've already had their arcs, so what are they going to do? Ah! Ah! Oh. So, Manny has a love interest in this one. It's a pretty standard thing to do in sequels, especially animated sequels. If the first movie didn't have a love interest, they introduce one in the sequel. If it did, the sequel introduces a rival. This doesn't inherently have to be bad. Honestly, I don't mind their relationship at all once they're actually together. But in Ellie's first appearance, they went in a really weird direction regarding Manny's relationship with her. For some reason, they set up this thing where Manny is led to believe that he's the last mammoth. This has never been mentioned before now, but everyone in the movie is suddenly talking about it like it's a commonly accepted fact. Was there a time skip? Were all of the main characters frozen for 20,000 years at the end of the first one? And for most of the movie, his belief that the survival of their species depends on it is pretty much the only thing motivating him. The main problem he faces is that she was raised by possums, so she thinks that she's a possum. This guy giving you trouble, sis? 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 That's right. These are my brothers. Possum, possum, possum. 
This is the main plot of the sequel. It's pretty ironic that, even in-universe, the only reason he begins pursuing a relationship with her is because he feels like he's obligated to. And out of the three main characters, Manny is easily the one they had the best idea of what to do with in this one. Diego and Sid are kind of just there the whole time. When a character's had their arc, and the writers aren't really sure what to do with them anymore, but want them to still feel like they're actually involved in the plot in some way, I feel like a commonly used solution is to just have them be a voice of reason that chimes in every once in a while, and that's pretty much what they do with Diego. It's especially prominent in this movie, but it's applicable to some degree for most of the other sequels as well. I mean, what else has he got going on in this one? He's afraid of water? Okay. Sid doesn't fare a whole lot better. It's not quite as noticeable with him, because in the first movie he already played a largely comic relief role, but he probably has as minimal a role in the story of this second movie as Diego does. The part of the movie that's most about him is this five-minute tangent that isn't related to anything. And honestly, it might have been funnier if it were just cut. Have Sid mention that he stumbled across this cult that worships him, and only reveal at the very end that they actually exist. If they really needed people to see this whole dance number they did with all the tiny sloths copying everything Sid does, they should have just released it as its own short or something. They do give these characters one moment near the very end of the movie, where Diego gives a monologue about how even though Sid is weird, annoying, and embarrassing, they like having him around because somehow he holds them together. And that's nice and all, but there's nothing that happens in this movie to really justify that. If anything, this speech should have been given at the end of the third movie. It'll probably become clear why when I get to that one. As for the meltdown, it's not excruciatingly awful or anything, it's just kind of dull. Another short that I've definitely seen before, but I couldn't even begin to imagine when or where. It's pretty simple. Once again, the premise is that Scrat is trying to get his acorn, only this time there's a time machine involved, so the chase goes through different points in history, and even into the past of the franchise. It's honestly not as interesting as that description might make it sound. I feel like when you go into the past of a franchise, it's usually used as an excuse to revisit iconic moments, but for some reason they don't do that here. He keeps appearing in these extremely bland locations with the other characters just standing in the distance looking at him. If not for the one moment where they played the soundtrack from the first movie and had the baby visible in the background for a second, I probably wouldn't even have realized these scenes were meant to be taking place in the past. A few mildly interesting things happen. There's a couple of nice scene transitions, it is pretty amusing when it's shown that Scrat has such a one-track mind that when multiple versions of him appear in the same time and space, even versions of him from earlier in this same short, they're hardly even surprised, they just see each other as rivals over the acorn. There are also a few strangely morbid parts, like when he finds the remains of all the main characters in the distant future, including his own, or when at one point he just abandons a version of Sid in ancient China. Other than that, it's pretty much just the same joke of Scrat chasing his acorn, only this time in settings that aren't just snow and ice. Why does the title of this make it sound like it's about survivors recounting their stories of Sid being a serial killer or something? This is the first piece of Ice Age media that I'd never seen before starting to work on this video. I don't even know where you're meant to watch it legitimately. I could only find it in a few parts on YouTube. While this series has shown that Sid is definitely capable of being a somewhat endearing character, this short shows that it's pretty situation-dependent. Sid is annoying, and a total loser isn't really a joke that can carry an entire story by itself, even if that story is only eight minutes long. In total fairness to Sid, some of the other characters in this aren't much less annoying, but, you know, there being other annoying characters isn't exactly a positive. The plot is that Sid is hosting a summer camp, because for some reason these prehistoric animals have summer camps. I assume it's meant to be the same one that was briefly mentioned near the beginning of the second movie, and he's really bad at it and the kids all hate him. There's very little about it that stands out, you can probably guess what every joke is from the premise alone. You know how earlier I was talking about checklist scenes? Every single scene in this short is one of those, and it's all just to build up to a joke that they've done a hundred other times in this series, where it's revealed that one of the characters shaped Earth's natural history. I'm not even sure why the adults trust Sid with their kids. The series is pretty clear about the fact that everyone aside from, sometimes the main cast, just hates him. I think at one point one of the kids mentions that it's supposed to be a confidence-building exercise, 
Was it supposed to build confidence by reassuring the kids that they can never be as embarrassing and pathetic as Sid? Well, if that was the intention, then mission accomplished, I guess. Whatever, next movie. Boom, boom, like a, like a, like a boom, boom, boom. More like Dick Jokes the movie. Because really, for something with a PG rating, this movie has so many of them. My ah! I thought you were a female! Let me tell you about the time I used a sharpened clamshell to turn a T-Rex into a T-Rachel. I feel tingly. Don't say that when you're pressed up against me. Not that kind of tingly. Oh, it's a boy! That's its tail. It's a girl! It's like the old saying. An eye for a tooth, a nose for a chin, a butt for a... Well, it's an old saying, but uh, it's not a very good one. That being said, most people seem to be in agreement that the series only gets worse with each new entry when... I couldn't disagree more. I think Dawn of the Dinosaurs is easily the best one. The movie opens, as usual, with Scrat trying to get his acorn, and the reason why I'm not just skipping past this part like I did in the first two movies is because his scenes are actually quite funny in this one. After having seen every piece of Ice Age media, I've concluded that Scrat works best as a character when he wants his acorn, but also has another opposing goal. In this case... Oh jeez. Her name is Scrat. Yeah, Scrat's love interest has the same name as him, except it's spelled fancy. What's interesting is, you can see in the behind the scenes that, earlier in production, her design was a little more... restrained? Which is pretty funny to me, because it implies that at some point in production, somebody with power at Blue Sky gave the order, make the squirrel sexier. Normally, giving one of the characters from the previous movies a love interest is about as generic a thing as you can possibly do for a sequel. Well, you know that already, seeing as I just called the second movie out for doing this. But here, it comes across a lot more like they actually had a funny idea for what to do with this character, rather than it just being an entry on their sequel checklist. It's simple, but watching this character who previously had a completely one-track mind, and whose biggest enemy tended to be his own stupidity and bad luck, suddenly having to deal with conflicting emotions and a rival he actually has a dynamic with, the humor just works. And this can be applied to the third movie as a whole. I'd say this is the only movie besides the first one where I don't really feel any sequelitis. The catalyst for the plot is that, for their own reasons, Manny and Diego were planning on going their separate ways. Manny and Ellie are having a kid, and Diego's having a little midlife crisis thing, and neither of them really plan on involving Sid in their future life plans. So Sid, abandonment issues back in full force, tries to cope by adopting a clutch of eggs that he finds, and that's basically where the title of the movie comes into play. I thought those guys were extinct. Well, then that is one angry fossil. Sid! Sid gets kidnapped, and the other two wind up reuniting in an effort to rescue him. Okay, regardless of your personal thoughts on it, that's a conflict that actually involves all three of the main characters. At least on a conceptual level, that makes it objectively a better sequel than The Meltdown. This is why I think that speech that Diego gives at the end of the second movie would be a lot more fitting here, by the way. This time, the group threatening to disband, and Sid being what winds up holding them together, is actually central to the conflict. What also helps, and is probably the main reason why this one is my favorite, is that, to me, even aside from the aforementioned scrat fem scrat scenes, this one is easily the funniest in the series. I'm probably going to come across as pretty childish for enjoying some of the humor that I do in this movie. Like, yeah, I get that chipmunk voices can be a pretty cheap way to get laughs out of kids, but I still really enjoy that laughing gas scene. One of the main sources of humor is Sid's dynamic with the dinosaur family. They really run with the premise of him passionately playing the role of Mr. Mom in this movie. Straight into a wall, sometimes, but honestly, that just makes it funnier. Oh, Emer, that really, really funny shot is going on. I think I know when you have a stupid grin or something. No, no. Look at the shadow coming up here. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe some of the humor in this movie you could argue is kind of unintentional, but even so, can you ever really fault a movie that's listed as a comedy for making you laugh? And all of that isn't even mentioning the best part of this movie, the other main source of humor. Yeah! <laughs> 
Buck is such a fun character. He isn't super deep or anything, but it really comes across like both Simon Pegg had a lot of fun voicing him, and that the animators had a lot of fun with his expressions and how he moved. Also, I instantly respect any character in this franchise more when they forgo the ridiculously obvious herd metaphor. I've forgotten what it was like to be part of a family. This movie would actually be a pretty solid conclusion to a trilogy. The characters all seem to have wound up in a good spot. Near the end, they do a title drop for the only time in this movie. It kind of feels akin to the whole Last Crusade, single use of the series' iconic main theme at the end thing. The very last shot before the credits is Strat doing his iconic scream into the camera. It really comes across like they were trying to bookend the series with this one, and it probably would have left the franchise in a respectable place. But even if I hadn't already mentioned it earlier, you could probably tell by the video's runtime, they didn't. Why does a franchise set 20,000 years before the events of the New Testament have a Christmas special? Like, okay, maybe if it were an origin story, that would still be really weird, but at least that would make a bit more sense. But no. What they do instead is randomly pick a few pieces of Christmas iconography to give origin stories to, but from the beginning in this short, Christmas is an established holiday that these characters have already been celebrating. Gift-giving is already a thing, but they used a Christmas rock, Oh, Christmas rock! Oh, Ugh. Christmas rock! You're 30 tons of granite! But then, Sid casually murders a bunch of children to use them as decorations. Something no one really bats an eye to. And now they have Christmas trees. Santa is already a thing. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Santa is now a character in this franchise. Because they hadn't already jumped the shark enough with the secret underground dinosaur world. But they do show the origins of why Santa has a sleigh pulled by reindeer, and the naughty and nice list, which, respectively, boil down to them just happening to meet a magical flying reindeer who wants to help out, and Manny bullshitting something on the spot. Isn't that exciting? Man, this sucks. Oh, there's also a musical number, set to the tune of Deck the Halls, and it is, no exaggeration, one of the worst things I've ever heard. What's a hall? Tis a season. What's a season? -la 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 -la. Just play along. Jeez, and I chewed surviving Sid out for consisting entirely of checklist scenes? This entire short, on a conceptual level, is an item on a checklist. Needless to say, when deciding to make a Christmas special for the Ice Age series, no one really had any ideas for what they should do with it, or even how they could make it make sense. They just did it because every cello animated property eventually does a Christmas special. I don't even have anything else to say about it. It's really bad, but in a really uninteresting way. I never even felt inclined to revisit this one as a kid. That's how you really know this one isn't worth your time. As I briefly mentioned earlier, the Continental Drift was kind of my jumping off point. This was the last piece of Ice Age media that I had seen prior to the marathon I did in preparation for this video. This one might actually have been my favorite as a kid. I'm not really sure why, but during that several month period where I watched one of the movies nearly every night, this was probably the one that I watched the most times. However, it really hasn't held up too well for me. After four movies in this series, the concept was definitely starting to wear a little thin. In the previous movies, the general framework was that the characters were all walking together from point A to point B, and by this point in time, they probably realized that that formula was going to get pretty stale. So this time round, they're split into two groups, and one of those groups is actually floating on a piece of ice from point A to point B. Isn't that a change in pace? But wait, you can't just have half the characters adrift at sea the whole movie. The kids are going to find that dull. So what are they going to do to spice it up a bit? Oh, must be a party cruise! Hey, they look fluffy! Ha! I get the big woolly one! Ha! <laughs> oh, gee. A girl who happens to be the same species as one of the main characters. I wonder what role this character's gonna play. Anyway, I'd comment on how ridiculous this whole pirate thing is, but after Santa... I'm just gonna take whatever this franchise throws at me. Let's see what kind of moves you got! Dance, little scrapfish! That's a coconut song! <laughs> also, fun fact. As far as I'm aware, that is actually the only time in the entire series that Scrat is referred to by name. The mere fact that they're pirates isn't the only thing that's conceptually strange about these pirate characters. 
They also have a musical number in a movie that isn't a musical aside from this one scene. The song isn't even horrible. It's definitely a lot better than that thing from the Christmas special. It's more just... why? This was also the point in the series where they started to get pretty egregious with the celebrity voice casting. Despite how minor a role most of these characters play, like, I'm pretty sure fucking Fatboy Tiger from the first movie has more lines than some of these guys, nearly all of them are voiced by some really well-known singer, or sitcom actor, or whoever, and I'm really struggling to understand why. It's not just the pirates either, this applies to pretty much all of the minor supporting characters. You've got the other Cornetto guy, that guy from Parks and Rec, that girl from Glee, that guy from The Big Bang Theory, Nicki Minaj, fucking Drake. Are people actually more likely to see an animated movie just because a famous person voices a character in it, no matter how minuscule their role is? Most of them don't even do enough for their voice to be featured in the trailer, or, as far as I could find, any of the marketing at all. Was it just to show off? Did they get this cast just because they could? Their leader is this ape, voiced by Peter Dinklage, and he's easily a contender for being my least favorite character in this entire franchise. And believe me, as we get into these later entries, that is a field with some fierce competition. The entire performance and the way the character is animated comes across as such a try-hard attempt at looking and sounding cool and intimidating, and it's really irritating, and I hate just about every moment he's speaking. That family is going to be the death of you. The only other pirate character of relevance is Diego's love interest. I don't have many thoughts on her. She's fine as far as token love interest characters introduced in the fourth movie of a series go. At the very least, she has an arc, even if it's pretty much a repeat of Diego's arc from the first movie. I guess her existence does in part lead to the siren scene, which, for a few reasons, is easily one of the weirdest scenes in the whole series. Enough about the pirates, though. What's happening with the group that didn't go adrift on the ice? The main character of this group is Manny's daughter, Peaches, and what they do with her is pretty much what they do with every teenager character in media. You know, choosing between her own independence and family loyalty, choosing between the cool crowd and her loser childhood best friend, all that jazz. Her friend is another candidate for my least favorite character in this whole series, and honestly, a lot of it just comes down to how he looks. I don't know why this one character design is so anthropomorphized compared to all the others. Like, he's supposed to be the same species as these things. Could they not think of any other way to make an animal look like a dweeb? Any of the other returning characters I haven't mentioned yet, you could pretty much just consider them leftovers from the previous movies, but I don't think there's a more egregious example of sequelitis, not just in this series, but in anything, than the possums in this movie. That might sound a bit weird. In the previous movies, the possums were minor supporting characters at best. I've barely even mentioned them before now. In the second movie, the whole joke with them was that they played the role of the stereotypical, hard-to-please tough guy family members of the love interest, despite being tiny, and in the third movie, they were mostly just Bucks fanboys. How could you possibly give sequelitis to characters who had such a small role to begin with? I don't know, but somehow they managed. In those last two movies, they at least felt somewhat involved in what was happening. They had dynamics with the rest of the cast, and stupid wasn't their sole character trait. In this fourth movie, every scene with them is effectively a cutaway gag, and they scarcely even interact with the rest of the cast. In fact, clips I've been playing in the background as I've been saying this, that is every time in the entire movie that they and one of the other characters actually talk to each other. Even other sequelitis characters, like Sid in this movie, at the very least still occasionally partake in some memorable interactions. You know, my mother once told me that bad news was just good news in disguise. Was this before she abandoned you? Yes, it was. So, I think I may have found where the franchise really started to fall off for me, but you know what? Even if the franchise had ended here instead of after the third movie, it still probably would be in a much more respectable spot than where it ended up going. This fourth movie was still a financial success, and at least some people liked it. But they just couldn't end it here, either. This series kept on trucking. <laughs> We're in uncharted territory now. From this point onwards, I hadn't seen any of the shorts or features I'll be discussing prior to this marathon. So, what is the Great Eggscapade like? Well, it's not as bad as the Christmas one. Like, at least it conceptually makes a bit more sense. It's actually an origin story this time. 
Easter is still sort of a pre-established thing that the characters already celebrate, but not in any recognizable form. And no magic flying reindeer or elf sloth things or Santas show up. The plot is that Sid wants to start an exiting business. By this point in the series, Sid is growing somewhat aware of the fact that nobody in their right mind would ever trust him with anything, let alone their unborn children. So to get customers for his business, he has to go out of his way to find people who are both desperate and who don't know him. The rabbit pirate from the fourth movie is back as the main villain in this, because he was such a compelling character. Here we go! What? <gasps> it's them! He's clearly been recast with a much worse actor which is pretty embarrassing on his replacement's behalf because he was already one of the weaker performances in that last movie. The conflict arises when the rabbit kidnaps the eggs because... Hold on. He wants to hold them for ransom in order to get the main group to build him a boat. They end up going on a hunt to find all the eggs, which the rabbit has hidden. There's the Easter connection. And they actually do a few moderately funny things with this. I did enjoy the moment where Scrat, who's been led to believe that one of the eggs is a giant acorn, ends up serving as the final obstacle. But, for the most part, the humor is more along the lines of what you'd expect from this franchise at this point in time. Manny, come out here! Your daughter is talking nonsense! Manny! I'm in my Manny cave watching the Hawks Bears game! Oh, also, the rabbit has a brother. I kind of forgot he was even a character in this. I mean, we got it made here! We sleep all day, we game all night, mom, like, she picks up all our droppings, dude. And for a reason that I can't for the life of me remember, even the wiki doesn't seem to know, this ends with him taking on the role of Easter Bunny. Well, at least there's no more holiday specials after this one. Every movie just has to up the ante further. I don't even know what they possibly could have done if they'd continued this trend for another movie after this. This time, the conflict is that a meteor is on a collision course with the Earth, you can probably guess what causes it, and is going to wipe out all life. Unless you want to get to, like, Star Wars or Avengers level of scope, which, knowing this franchise, they honestly might have, you quite literally cannot have higher stakes than that. The sixth one should have been about Scrat causing the Big Bang. <laughs> making no sense. You know, like, um, you know Tom and Jerry? Um, yeah, obviously. I just kind of feel like they're, like, these immortal characters that are just constantly in feud, and that's why they always appear in these, like, different time periods. I feel like Scrat's kind of like that. He's what? Just, like, this immortal figure in a constant, like, conflict with something... So that's why it would make sense for him and his acorn to just exist before the Big Bang and then cause it. <laughs> no, he's like literally God. <laughs> if it wasn't already clear from the last few entries, by now they have long since completely given up on the setting of this franchise making any sense. One of the first few scenes of the movie has Manny and Diego sitting in a bar. There's a mariachi band that shows up for comedic effect a few times. Late in the movie, there's a full-on wedding with, like, a chapel and an altar and the Here Comes the Bride song playing in the background. Why are these movies even set in prehistoric times anymore? This is also where they just gave up on trying to think of new things to do with the main characters, so they're kind of cast aside in this one, in favor of... Oh, hello, mammals! Yup, Buck's back in this one. And this must be Nectarine. Um... Peaches? Manny! Pineapples! Pineapples? She gets cravings. Pomegranates? Grapefruits? Nectarines? Okay, if that was intentional, that was a decent callback for people like me who know way too much about this series. Aside from that, I'd like to say that Buck's return is a positive, but he's been pretty flanderized. In the third movie, he mainly had a pretty metal personality, and the jokes that implied he was kind of insane were comparatively occasional. But this time round, being crazy is pretty much his whole thing. Like, in the third movie, there was a five-second joke where he claimed he was married to a pineapple, and honestly, depending on how you interpret it, he could have just been joking in response to Manny's rhetorical question. But in this movie, he has an entire subplot where he adopts a pumpkin because he thinks it's a baby. God, isn't she gorgeous? How can he tell it's a sheep? Oh. 
Oh, the character from the third movie brought the dick jokes with him. He and Scrat are pretty much the only two out of the 50 or so characters in this movie that actually have any impact on the plot. Scrat accidentally sends the meteor careening towards the Earth, then Buck is the one who discovers the prophecy detailing where and when the meteor is going to hit. Because, yeah, that's a thing. It also says that this has happened twice before, every hundred million years. With Scrap being the immortal, eternal being that he is, I'm just gonna assume that he somehow caused the last two as well. Buck is also the one who comes up with the plan that allows them to prevent the impact. Everybody else is pretty much relegated to standing in the background and occasionally delivering a one-liner while the plot just sort of happens around them. Our main characters spend most of the movie being reduced to the same role as the random background animals from the previous movies. Well, actually, scratch that. At least the random background animals were sometimes funny. Nobody move a muscle. <laughs> and it's not just the returning characters. The new characters don't fare any better. Like, they introduce these villainous dinosaur bird characters. Their plan is that they want the apocalypse to happen because Buck will die in the apocalypse, and they hate Buck. They keep cutting back to them like they're setting them up as a threat. Like, whatever, that's pretty normal, the previous movies did this too. But then, as soon as they actually catch up with the main group, they're immediately told that their plan is stupid because they're just gonna die in the apocalypse as well, and then they flip sides just like that. So... What even was the point of introducing and setting up these characters when they're barely going to do anything, and what little they do was immediately undone by them? How do they pretend to justify why the characters from the previous movies should even still be here? Well, Manny's arc in this movie is pretty much just an exact repeat of his arc from the previous movie. The only difference this time is that Ellie also has that same arc, which is... something, I guess? I don't know, I'm grasping at straws here. I do still have to make the case for why this isn't the very worst movie in the series, because, yeah, believe it or not, it still finds a way to get even worse after this one. With Diego, they don't even try. His conflict in this is that he and Shira, his love interest from the previous movie, want to have kids, but the local kids are all scared of them because they're a predator species, and they're afraid their kids will be ostracized in the same way. What is this, Zootopia? This, straight up, just isn't resolved on screen. It's brought up near the beginning, it's never mentioned again for most of the runtime, and then near the very end it cuts back to them, and I guess the kids have suddenly started liking them. As for Sid, well, following the pattern set by the last three movies, I guess they decided it was finally his turn to have a love interest in this one. I'm just gonna ignore the fact that she's an immortal who comes from a society of animals that stay young forever because of... crystal power, or something. Trust me, it's just about impossible to talk about every bizarre thing in this movie. I'm having a hard enough time staying focused in this segment without going on yet another tangent. This subplot is about as checklist as they come, and I imagine it's only included because they thought it would have been a bit mean-spirited to have Sid be the only main character from the original movie to never get a love interest, despite being the only character who started off wanting one. By comparison, they at least tried to have the previous token relationships have something to them, Theirs pretty much begins and ends with it being played for laughs that she's the one who makes the first move on him, instead of the other way around like you'd expect. She's played by the singer Jessie J, and she... isn't great. Hey, I know this is gonna sound super forward, but... will you be my mate for life? I already thought the celebrity voice casting was getting pretty egregious in the fourth movie, but you know what? In that one, most of them at least had acting on their resume. Here, we've got the aforementioned Jesse J, we've got astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson in his first role where he doesn't play himself. Well, I mean, he basically plays himself. Neil DeBuck Weasel. An American football player. There's a fucking YouTuber in the cast. I don't even know how I can wrap this back around and conclude this segment. Every wrong or weird thing in this movie leads to tangents about other things that are wrong or weird, and then those tangents just lead to more tangents. And, just as a cherry on top, this movie has a dance party ending, something this franchise had pretty surprisingly avoided up until now. At least in the third and fourth movies, any dancing was saved for the credits. When this was released, it seemed that the public interest in this franchise was finally about as dried up as the studio's ideas for it were. 
This was the first movie in the series to make less than its predecessor, and by quite a lot. It barely even made more than the first movie, and appropriately, it was the series' last theatrical release. Not its last feature film, however. We'll get to that pretty soon. Well, this was pointless. This short is just all of Scrat's scenes from Collision Course strung together, with an occasional deleted scene added in. It even shares its poster and title card with Collision Course. A couple of times it's presented like it's a Lion King one and a half sort of deal, like they cut to a scene from the main movie and it's like, oh, it turns out that that happened in the other movie because of some behind the scenes influence from the character we're following in this movie. Except these scenes with Scrat were in the main movie, so we already knew that. The only thing that's been added in this is a sequence where he fights a trio of aliens that happen to resemble Fem Scrat from the third movie. So we can add at least three more to Scrat's already massive body count. I guess while he's the main focus, I can talk about how, in Scrat's scenes in this movie, they lean a lot more heavily into crudeness than they used to. Like, what was the most overtly crude joke with him in the previous movies? One time he gets hit in the nuts? Haha, <laughs> get it? There was certainly nothing nearly on the level of him repeatedly having his acorn shoved up his asshole. The same can be said about how many cartoony sound effects they use now, the likes of which I can't say I recall them using previously, at least not nearly to this degree. I don't know if flanderization is quite the right term to use here, but it certainly feels very akin to how a lot of the other returning characters were handled in this latest entry. Pretty impressive that they could manage to do such a thing to a character that doesn't even talk. And this nearly could have been seen as this character's conclusion. Like I said, there is one more feature film, but Scrat, the series mascot, is mysteriously absent in it. Well, I suppose I should stop prefacing this dreaded sixth feature and actually get into it. I'm a bad boy doing good things. Gotta lemonade. The Ice Age Adventures of Buck Wild is really weird. For starters, it's not a TV show. When I first heard of it, I really thought it was. That title heavily implies that this is going to have some kind of episodic nature, but no, it's a single story that begins and then ends. Also, Buck isn't even the main character, the possums are. You know, remember them? They're still in these movies. So, why is it called The Adventures of Buck Wild? Then, when you start watching it, for some reason it opens with a recap of the previous movies? What, was it because it had been a while since the last one? They'd had four-year gaps before, was six years that much of an increase? Or were they actually expecting anyone who hadn't already seen the previous movies to be remotely interested in watching this? This recap is narrated by Ellie. It took me a minute to figure this out, because she's been recast, and the new voice actress doesn't sound even a little bit like her previous one. Me too! Everyone falls out of the tree every now and then, they just don't admit it. They say a mammoth never forgets. Well, as I get older, I find they don't always remember either. In fact, nearly everybody's been recast. Simon Pegg is the only actor to reprise his role in this one, and I'm baffled as to why this could be the case. This series has to have had one of the most loyal main casts of any franchise ever. They all came back for those Christmas and Easter TV specials. Apparently most of them even came back for the video game adaptations that I haven't played. Hey, Sid! You're awake! Is it noon already? <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Yet they couldn't get them to come back for this? Despite opening on a recap, one of the most confusing things about this movie is when it takes place. Like, hold on. I'm wearing gloves for this bit because I don't feel like showing off my disgusting winter chapped hands. Anyway, this movie is the sixth entry in a series that thus far has taken place chronologically, so your immediate assumption would be that it takes place after the fifth movie. However, that doesn't really work because there were several changes to the status quo in the fourth and fifth movies that aren't present in this movie, with several characters that join the main group in those entries being nowhere to be found in this one. The most recent change in the status quo that's actually acknowledged in this movie was the main characters meeting Buck, which happened in the third movie. So, okay, maybe this one takes place in between the third and fourth movies. But then, as you watch it, you realize there are changes to the status quo in this movie that then aren't reflected in the fourth and fifth movies, so that doesn't work either. Alright then, 
Maybe it's one of those retconning half-reboots that some long-running franchises do, where some of the previous movies are canon, but then it diverges at a certain point. For another example, the Halloween franchise has done this like three times. But even that doesn't make sense, because some characters from the third movie are missing as well. The third one was where Peaches was born, and she isn't present, or even mentioned in this one. And wait, even though the characters that join their group in the fourth and fifth movies aren't acknowledged at all, in the opening recap they reference the events of the fourth movie. Also, Buck still has his pumpkin daughter, which he got in the fifth movie. And there's a scene in this movie where the possums are taught how to use pea shooters, even though we've already seen them using those in this series. In their introductory scene, no less. What is this? Sorry if I'm spending too long on this. It probably seems a bit nitpicky to talk about continuity in a series where basically every event in natural history was caused by a squirrel trying to get his acorn. But I think the writer's ability to keep a coherent timeline sets a good precedent for how competent every other aspect of this movie is. Let's go back to how nearly everyone was recast. It's so unbelievably distracting. Diego sounds... fine. Aside from you, nothing smells bad. So, no. Everyone else sounds really off, and most of them are blatantly much worse actors. Sid and Manny in particular I found to be pretty bad. Hey, Uber Tracker, you picked up their scent yet? Manny, they're out there all alone in the cold. They're probably frightened. No, don't worry, we'll find them. Because if we don't find them, I'm gonna kill them. And it's not just the voices either. If you didn't know already, or hadn't figured it out just by looking at it, this movie was not made by Blue Sky. It was animated by that Disney subsidiary that does those weird straight-to-Disney Plus Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies. Even ignoring the blatant drop in quality, and the large number of shots that straight up look unfinished, so much of this movie is just wrong, visually. Most of the new character designs look really out of place, and it seems like they simply did not know how to animate the existing ones. It's easiest to see with Sid's facial expressions. He keeps doing this dopey smile that doesn't remotely resemble anything he did in the older movies. Looks like they could have done with their own version of the Simpsons no-no sheets. As for the plot, after Manny complains about them because of a mess they caused and says they'd never get by without the group's protection, the possums feel challenged and decide to go find Buck and try to live like him. You know what? If they were to perform the entirely unnecessary task of making yet another Ice Age movie, conceptually, that isn't the worst idea. It's certainly a better idea than trying to up the ante even further after that previous movie. But it's not really substantive enough to be the main plot of a feature-length movie. It feels a lot more like it should have been a short, or a B-plot from one of the previous movies. Maybe the third one, considering they pretty much forgot about these characters after that one anyway. Or the first episode of a TV show, which I actually think is what this was originally intended to be. The villain certainly feels a lot more like a villain of the week from a generic episodic cartoon than one from a movie, so that tracks. I think I can safely conclude that Disney's first attempt at doing something with this property really didn't go too well. Even the very worst releases under Blue Sky were significantly better than this. If they ever try and do something with the Ice Age series again, they're probably going to have to wind up completely ignoring this one. I mean, does anyone who actually saw this movie want to see more stuff like it? It's probably just going to forever exist in this weird space, where it's not properly connected to any other piece of Ice Age media that's come out before or since. Well, here we have it. The Ice Age series' last official release. After his mysterious absence in the last movie, series and studio mascot Scrat is back one more time. He has a son now. I don't really know how this came about, considering the first episode has him just finding the kid somewhere, but apparently he actually is Scrat and Femscrat's biological child. And honestly, this kind of comes out of nowhere after the series' straight shot of awfulness since, what, 2011? But it's pretty good. I would consider it to be the second best piece of Ice Age media, only behind the third movie. They land back on that simple but effective formula they used in the third movie where Scrat has to balance two conflicting goals. In this case, wanting the acorn, because of course, and wanting to bond with this kid, who, because he's also a member of the Scrat species, also wants the acorn. And it doesn't seem like they just landed back on this formula by accident. 
Based on certain presentation choices, it's pretty clear that they knew this opposing goal formula was exactly what this character needed to be funny. Baby Scrat is well-designed as far as cutesy characters go, and his dynamic with his father is pretty endearing to watch. It is difficult to say much more about this miniseries without starting to just summarize the plots of each episode. The segments are only four minutes long and don't have any dialogue. But, as weird as it is to say this about a piece of Ice Age media post-Dawn of the Dinosaurs, this is actually worth watching. I suppose even though this isn't really one of my reviewing and ranking videos, I can still give a rough ranking of the series. If I were to put them into tiers, Surviving Sid, A Mammoth Christmas, Collision Course, Spaced Out, and The Adventures of Buck Wild are the really bad ones. Gone Nutty, The Meltdown, Continental Drift, and The Great Escapade range from kind of bad to just dull. Then No Time for Nuts is... fine. And as for Scrap Tales, it can proudly join the original and Dawn of the Dinosaurs in The Good Ones. Scrat is one resilient motherfucker. Dude's been eaten, repeatedly crushed, struck by lightning, been lost in space, been left trapped in the wrong time period, twice, has actually canonically died before, there's a moment in this miniseries where he actually canonically dies again, and this time he forcefully brings himself back to life. Somehow, he always finds a way to come back. But, not this time. You might be confused. I thought that was every piece of Ice Age media. What's this? Well, when I prefaced Scrat Tales by saying it was the series' last official release, I didn't include that word for no reason. What you are looking at right now is, in a way, one of the saddest pieces of animation ever created. This 30-second clip of Scrap finally deciding to just eat his acorn instead of burying it, before giving a satisfied half-smile and bouncing off-screen, was the last thing that Blue Sky Studios ever animated, done by the few remaining employees in their final days of operation before Disney shut them down in early 2021. It was uploaded to YouTube anonymously in April of 2022, on the same day Scrat Tales premiered on Disney+. Plus. According to the uploader, supposedly a former Blue Sky employee, they did this because they wanted to go out on their own terms. Listen, these movies and accompanying shorts aren't exactly my very favorites today. Being objective, some of them are actual garbage. But they were a big part of my childhood, as they were for many other people around my age. And while I don't have much personal attachment to any of Blue Sky's other movies, I'm sure there are plenty of people who do. So, the studio's eventual fate of being bought out, shut down, and with a lot of its employees probably being left without many easy ways of getting back into the industry, because Blue Sky was the only major American animation studio based on the East Coast, it's sad. So I am glad that they were able to produce one bittersweet element to it, by finally giving a proper conclusion to the iconic character whose creation was largely responsible for putting their studio on the map. And yeah, it's definitely a bit soon to say that we're never going to see this franchise or these characters ever again. There's a decent chance that at some point down the line, whether it be 20 years from now or the day after I release this video, Disney or some other studio that winds up with the rights will reboot it or remake it or, god forbid, try to make another sequel. Who knows what that'll be like if and when they do, but based on the previous attempt at this franchise by a studio that isn't Blue Sky, my hopes aren't exactly high. I don't even want to imagine what this Ice Age Babies thing I found on the wiki would be like if it comes to exist. At least as far as the series' original run under Blue Sky goes, that's seemingly over. I'm just rambling now though, so let's cut off this conclusion before I end up doubling the length of this video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.